Good evening, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you. Uh, so glad that you're here with us for our Thursday evening Bible study as we are in the Word of God, looking at what God is saying to us in this time for the purpose of applying that Word to our lives. We, this is not a, um, you know, this isn't just a biblical studies class. We're not just here to learn just more about the Bible, but we're here so that we can actually not only see God's purpose for our lives, but also live that purpose out. That's exactly what, you know, we are the, supposed to do. That's what our new life is all about. And that's what our study is actually all about. You know, we've been doing a study on the book of Titus. I'm going to be coming today at the book of Titus, chapter number three. I'm going to start at verse number one and then in verse number two. I'm, this was going to be coming out of the NIV version. Uh, once again, that's Titus, chapter number one, starting at uh, chapter number three. Starting at verse number one and ending in verse number two. And I'm, I'm assuming you'll probably also see that on your screen. So, you know, when you look at uh, this Titus, and I'll read this for you in your hearing. So you'll hear it. And then we'll have a word of prayer. And then we're going to get directly into the word of God. I'm assuming that's why you're here. That's why you you tuned in. Listen, don't forget to share. It's really important. Uh, you know, I think God's been doing some dynamic things. He's been, you know, breathing some dynamic word. And we want to make sure as many people that can hear this word, that can be as impacted, and as many lives that can be changed by this word, you know, that it can spread as, as far as possible. We know that the enemy, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, as, uh, as, as sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Listen, people are going to great lengths to get poison out to all people. They're, they're going to great lengths to get all kinds of corruption that are going to corrupt the minds of our young people, corrupt the minds of people, period. And they're doing a great, great job of getting it out, disseminating that information among the masses. Well, we, you know, we have an obligation as believers to make sure that not only do we support each other, but that we get information out, we get revelation out, we get real rhema word out that's going to impact uh, the, the people of God. And the Bible says, you know, again, as that sin does abound, Grace abounds much more. Let's get into the word. Titus chapter 3. Uh, it says, uh, this is verse number 1. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities and to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, and to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. It's great. Now, that, that's the word. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again for opening our hearts and our ears, giving us an opportunity to be able to hear your word. God, we thank you right now that we know that it's not going to return void. There's an assignment that your word is on concerning our lives, concerning this day, concerning our communities, concerning this time. So we just bless you right now for all that you're doing. And we just pray right now for rapt attention from your people that they will hear each and every word that you have to speak. So they'll be ready to stand against the, 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 the wiles of the devil in this evil day. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take a look at this word. Hi, Mom. Now, let's take a look at this. Uh, the scripture says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. This sounds like our standard passive Christianity, but this really is not. This is really a totally different uh, situation. And, you know, many times you'll look at this and say, well, you know, back in the Bible days, you know, they didn't have to go through what we have to go through. And we don't, we sometimes we look at those days and we think the devil's different. You know, we think that government's different. We, and we don't realize because we don't really study history that we'll understand that, you know, it repeats itself, that that stuff that we're dealing with today has already been done. There are other saints that have dealt with the very same environments that, uh, that, that we are dealing with. And this was a very contentious political environment. There was a very, very divisive divi environment, and Christians were not very popular in this environment. The, so, so unpopular that there was a governmental crackdown. And this governmental crackdown on Christians, they, they were suspicious of believers. This had slowed the growth of the church. This uh, Making this unpopular was not just that um, you know, people shunned you and didn't like you, but they were also, there was also physical attacks. There was also violence against the church. There was also theft against property. And, and because churches were, you know, in homes, this impacted families directly. So, you know, when you look at how believers were viewed in that day, you can begin to see even now as, as this letter is going out to the church in Crete, this, this word is going out to the world right now concerning the very same things that are happening to the church and happening to Christianity. As it's being looked at this very same way, people are suspicious 
of this group of people. And so they have a bad reputation. You know, in, in the, because of the governmental crackdown, it gave the church a very bad reputation among non-believers. So it also slowed up, again, the growth of the church. So when Paul is speaking and writing to Crete right now, he's speaking to people who whom the government is extremely suspicious of and because their conduct is different. One of the things about this is that they are really, they don't really flow with, with the tide. These are people that have come from the same environment, but are now walking and living in a new life. And it didn't bring about a resurgence. It didn't bring about some great revival where people were saying, wow, I want to be like that. Or, you know, when you have a society that is going in a certain direction, a direction of personal freedom, a direction of being able to be loose and to do whatever I want. When you get people who walk in restraint, when you see people who have power and authority, but that authority is not like the authority that is generally recognized, you'll find out that it doesn't bring an embrace. It's going to, it's going to feel abrasive to other people. Righteousness feels abrasive to uh, a society of unrighteousness. You know, the Bible says the wicked flee when no man pursues. So they're going to feel put upon. They're going to feel, you're talking about me. So when you talk about righteousness, they're going to feel judged that, you know, and so you have a whole government, a system that, that is there where they look now and say, well, wait a minute, these people give allegiance to a whole nother king. You know, they, they may submit to, uh, you know, our authority, but they give allegiance to another king. They worship not in the same places we worship. They don't, they're not at that temple. These people are in their homes and they don't support pagan worship. They're nothing like us. So the culture looked for any vice. The culture had its eyes out. It had binoculars on looking at the church, looking for anything that they could assign blame to. Listen, we're in that place right now. The cameras are up. People are watching. Everybody's recording. And they're looking for something to blame in the people of God. There's a, a whole band of people that have gathered together and now are just waiting to be able to say, I told you. They're nothing like they thought. All that judgment, all that stuff they said, all that I'm supposed to be set apart and different and, you know, a new creature in Christ. I told you that's them fighting. I told you that's them at the same place that I'm going. They're looking for that. And the Jewish culture also had put the church under scrutiny. With all this going on, here's the, 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 uh, the admonition and the instruction that he gives Titus. He says, listen, remind them to be subject to the rulers and the authorities that, that, that are there. He, you know, this, the words that are, you know, this to be subject to is to put yourself under them. Listen, one of the things that Titus says uh, to the church, and this is so important, he says, remind them. Listen, every now and then, you know, you don't get new, fresh revelation, but you have to be reminded about some things because the push of culture can move the church in a direction that it is not even aware it's a, it's not even aware that it's going. You know, just like on a ship, you have to remind the helmsman to to you know they they will say mind you know mind the helm. And what it means is watch the you know watch the direction of the ship. Why? Because it can drift without you knowing it. You know, if you just are looking in the wrong direction before you know it, not only are you you're steering a course that's not your course. You're steering a course that's given to you by the wave of culture because you haven't been watching your course. Minding the helm is not looking at your environment, minding the helm is looking at the charts to be able to see what's the course that was charted to make sure you're constantly on point. Listen, we, we, the church is going through the very same reminder upheaval now. You, you got to understand that when Titus is told to, to remind them, that means that there's some things that they have probably forgotten, which means there's some things that they're probably doing that are a little bit off course. And when we're reminded, one of the things we have to do is understand that this is God's way of saying, get back on course. These are not new teachings. These are things that you obviously had if you're reminded. But, you know, Paul is telling him, listen, I had given these foundational teachings. You know what's there. So these are new revelation. You don't need to run around and find another church. and You don't need to go to another seminar. What you need to do is re be reminded of the foundation, reminded of what the real charge is in the first place. We've got so many things going on. We've got shootings that are going on. You know, I mean, listen, there's crazy gun legislation that should, you know, this should be easy, but it's, ex it's extremely hard. You know, when you look at mental illness, 
violence. You've got all manner of things that are going to violence everywhere. You know, and what are we supposed to do with it? And you know what? Every now and then, we can really, really get caught up in what's going on, and we can forget our purpose. And sometimes God comes and says, mind the helm. Don't forget what your lane is. You are here for a reason. You know, I mean, it would just be like, you know, a teacher. And a teacher's teaching and, you know, and policing in class. And before you know it, they can become a cop. And, you know, and you, you they can forget. You're not here to police. You don't have to police. That's what happens when we start putting guns. If we, you know, teachers should have guns. Well, guess what? They're going to need to mind the helmet at some point because they're going to become little cops. So what God is saying, the church can get off of its course. It can forget it's real purpose. It can feel like our purpose is to make our environment better. Our purpose is to make sure our children are safe. Our purpose is to make sure that our communities have the right leaders. But is that really why Christ died? Listen, the, the truth is he knew that Christians would get engrossed in political controversy, right? And, and, and that controversy was by the enemy, a distraction. We're in the world but we're not of the world. Now, I'm not saying that we don't get involved in politics at all. I'm not saying that we don't vote. I'm not saying that what goes on around us is not important because Paul is making the point. We are not just citizens of the kingdom. We're citizens of our community. But if we get involved in, and get distracted from what we're supposed to bring to the community, then the community doesn't gain by adding additional activists. The community misses the gospel evangelists that are supposed to be the, the, in, in, in going out in the community and doing what? Making disciples. That's our great commission. We're not making Republicans. We're not making Democrats. That's, that's not our job. Again, I'm not, we're not against Republicans and Democrats, but we can forget that God is like, there are, real, there are serious organisms out there that are political. There are serious organisms out there that are social, but there's one organism out there, one organism created by God that leads men from darkness to light. And wouldn't it be a shame that the darkness to light people leave the darkness to light business and go into the political business, leave the darkness to light business and go into the social business, leave the darkness to light business and go into the policing business. So Christians can still be involved in politics, but we always need to remember what's our real priority. And that's what was going on then, that's what's going on now. We get distracted, you know, and, you know, we, you can walk out and before you know it, you know, you, yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm, you know, I'm also Italian. Yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm also black. Yeah, I'm Christian, but I'm also white. And all of that can weave itself into some weird thing that stops being Christian. It stops being a believer. It makes us a black Christian. It makes us a white Christian. It makes us an Italian Christian. But it doesn't, somehow, all of a sudden, that begins to matter. And the reality is that God comes back and he brings the church back and says, what's your real purpose? Because if we understand our purpose, we actually are unifiers. That there is no male or female, Jew or Greek. That's that's our purpose. But that's not the around centered around po politics it's centered around the pursuit that is first and foremost we teach people how to pursue god that's exactly what we do and so you know th this is a difficult te teaching that paul is giving to timothy because they're in oppression they're they're being oppressed and so they are you know he says now i want you to be subject to these authorities and this has real serious meaning when you've been oppressed this, this really can seem even, maybe you don't know what I'm going through. Well, you know what? The reality is that Paul recognized you're picking up the mindset of the oppressor. I want you to get that. You know, he, he's talking to Titus, and there's a bunch of rebels here. You know, I'm not putting up with that. He said, listen, I need you to understand, that's not a Jesus mindset. The truth of the matter is, that's the Roman mindset. The Roman mindset was overthrowing anything it didn't like. It was throwing into chaos anything it didn't like. It had an anti-authority mindset. It was the major authority, but it wasn't going to have another authority. There could be no authority over it. So if it didn't like the leadership that was there, they didn't have to follow it. So when you begin to think about that, and the Cretans were able to now justify it because, you know, God's my king. I don't have to follow the laws of the land. I follow God. Well, listen, when that church, when that, when that attitude is adapted uh, into the church, you know what it does? It draws attention, but it draws negative attention. It draws away from the growth of the church. And you know what it does? It puts our attention on fallen leaders.
That's exactly what it does. It makes us believe that somehow they need to be in our churches giving speeches on Sunday, that somehow they need to be telling us about, you know, what they're going to do about roads and bridges on Sunday morning, that somehow we just feel great that we we had, you know, the state senator came in and he gave the sermon this morning. How outrageous, how, you know, how outlandish is that, that we actually are cool with that and somehow, the, you know, I need your endorsement, Bishop, and that somehow, you know, me letting him come into the pulpit and we come lay hands, that's the thing we actually believe believe we're supposed to do. Listen, this thinking, this mindset of being subject to, to the leaders that are in the church has a purpose. And these leaders are not in the church. This is subject to all authorities that are there. We have a duty to be honorable citizens. That's part of what the world is going to see. We have a duty to be exemplary citizens in our local communities as, and, and obey even our national governments, even when we do not like them. Even bad government is better than no government. And we listen, we have to get that. God is not talking about, like, you have to like the direction that the government's going in. No, not at all. No way. And, but, and a regime can actually be ungodly, and it may be unchristian. But the breakdown of government in and of itself is not something that we pray for. The Bible tells us that we ought to pray for government. So this is not like a pro-government sentiment. It is really what happens in darkness. God is saying, I want you to shine. I, I want you to shine. Then listen, when we look at the idea of like, well, let's get rid of all the police. Let's defund the police. Do you know the world we would live in right now? Th this is not an endorsement of police policemen, but, but this is also not a breakdown of, of police in total. The same way that we hate this idea of this blanket, all of them are like that. We can't do that with the police, but I can tell you right now, the Bible says that they do not hold the sword. They don't carry the sword in vain. The law is for the lawless, and if you do not believe it, look at the number of people. I, I think we have 40 shootings in Philadelphia this weekend. You know, I mean, I, I think that, that, you know, we don't look at them as mass shootings, right? So there, you know, there were over 40, 60, I think, in Chicago over the weekend. So when you begin to look at this, you sure that we don't need to pray for the government? You sure that we don't need to be subject? You sure that we need to be a part of the tide of chaos that's out there? There's absolutely no way. This would be purged 24-7. And we've got to remember this. God is the one who places rulers over us, not our vote. We somehow think, you know, I mean, listen, I'm going to control it in the ballot box. And that's cool. You know, and that's a cool thinking. And that's a good way of, you know, I mean, that's a peaceable way of doing it. But you know what? When we understand how this all works, the truth of the matter is, it's God, not our votes that put leaders in their places. It's the Lord who says that. So whether, whether you like Trump or not, whether you like Obama, whether you like Clinton, whether you like Putin, uh, you know, Chairman P uh, Ping, uh, Kim jong Un. doesn't matter. The reality is you may not like your, your mayor, but each of them have been preordained by God. And the Lord says, listen, your, your, your attitude here concerning authority is being watched. He raises up leaders. He brings down leaders. And our purpose is not to try to bring down leaders. Our purpose is not to try to tear down institutions. You know what our purpose is to be? Christ-likeness. That's the job. That's the role. That's the primary role. Listen, if a government is ungodly, I am not saying that it does not need to come down. If there's a government that is, is, is oppressing people, I am not saying that government needs to stop. But I want you to understand what the priority for the believer is. It is Christ-likeness Christ -likeness regardless of what the situation is. So you got to understand that. That's even when we don't, we don't, this is not about agreement. When we look at the world, this is not about our agreement. It's how we react. It's not about whether I agree with that law, but there are some laws that I may not like, but they do not in any way cause me to compromise. So guess what? I have to obey that law. I may not care. I may not care about whether I, do I need to wear a helmet if I, you know, I'm, I'm on a motorcycle. It's my motorcycle. Yeah, but here's the thing. We've got to obey the law. So Christians are, are supposed to submit to, to these laws. But guess what? We don't necessarily have to obey every single one. We're, we're instructed to pray for the government, but anything that, that, is, that is contrary, that violates the laws, that will cause us to compromise, no way. We, it's already told to us. We defer to a higher law, but it must be a law that causes us to compromise the word of God. You, remember, and as you begin to look at this, Jesus himself said, listen, render unto Caesar what is due Caesar. 
but we also must render unto God what is due God. I suspect that as, as Titus is being taught here, we may be in a situation where there were people who were rendering so much more to Caesar. We're thinking so much more about Caesar and forgot what they were supposed to do and, and rendering to God. You know, we are primarily governed by Christ. And it is Christ who said, listen, there are some things that, that, that Caesar is due you, that you have to give him. And there are some governmental rules you may not like. But one of the things that makes us who we are is that there are things that we don't like all the time. But submission doesn't require liking it. You know, when we submit to authority, it doesn't mean like I like that. You know, they, you know, I can't go down that road. You know, I'm not supposed to park there. I don't like that. I've got to park all the way around the corner. But if I'm looking at myself as a citizen of the kingdom and my community, then I've got to obey the law. I've got to understand that Jesus himself never committed sin against Rome. So, you know, every one of us, when you begin to look at this, this is a spirit that comes from God. We have a duty here, and every leader here has a duty to remind people to be submissive to magistrate. Well, here's what Paul says. He says, I want you to be obedient. Now, this is separate, again, from submission. Because we, we, this obedience is actually, I want you to actually carry it out. You know, we, you know, we are called to actually follow the commands of the government as long as they do not contradict the, the commands of God. Listen, obedience is an important form of, a, a, well, just a, a show of who we are. And as we are obedient, people are able to see this. This is not only Old Testament, this is also New Testament. Though it's not a part of earning our salvation, our obedience is not connected to our salvation. Let me tell you what it's connected to. It's connected to our example of living before others. This whole thing is not about us. You know, the reality is, you know, there's submission to things that we do. And you look for the reason and like, why would I submit to that? I don't even like that. Well, God says, Titus, tell them that people are watching. Let them know that in the midst of this persecution, the eyes are on you. In the midst of all that's going on, you know, in, in the world right now, people are looking for us. And even if they're looking for something to blame and looking for some way to bring us down, guess what? That's still looking. And when a person, you know, listen, we are supposed to refuse unjust laws, right? And when we accept the punishment that comes with that. We, we're supposed to be submissive, but there's some things we can't be obedient to. I get that. We, there's some things that the Bible says well, you, have to, you have to obey God rather than man. Yes, I get that. There's some circumstances where it could be, you know, will violate the fundamental truths of the gospel. I get that. And that's why Paul tells Titus, let them know this, Titus, and this is important, to be ready to do whatever is good. Now, you know, you look at this, and I think that there is this... Um, view of Christianity that's really, really passive. I mean, there, I think there's a there's a level of weakness that, that many people have looked at. When you look at these scriptures, there's a, like, just do whatever you're supposed to do. Just be a good, you know, be, be a good boy, be a good girl, right? That's what, you know, kind of sounds like that, a pat on the head type of situation. But I want you to understand what Titus is really, really exhorting, and meant to exhort these leaders to do. Titus is telling them to, to infuse their uh, members with this understanding that this is not a simple, you know, kowtowing and bowing to the government, but it's to stand for that which is good. We are made, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are created in Christ in order to do good works, to do good deeds, that God planned for us in advance. The, the truth of the matter is, wait a minute, God knew darkness was going to be there. God knew that the, the culture was going to be haywire. He knew it was going to be off the chain. And guess what? We are ordained to good works. We're ordained to be the best. We're ordained to be ones where they can find no blame. Listen, when you know they're going to find blame, you clean it up, right? When you know there's going to be an inspection, you clean it up. God is only telling Titus to remind the people in Crete that there is an inspection going on, that there's a spotlight on them right now. Don't let them find anything. You know, in the military, if you know there's going to be inspection, you want to make sure that everything is clean and, and you run your own hand across it. You make sure that there's no dust anywhere, and especially since you know it's not a surprise inspection. It's one that's happening right now. 
And so when you look at morality, this is not something, you know, Christians shouldn't be, you know, well, you know, at the time of elections, this is the moment where we talk about our issues and what's, you know, the way we need to live. And all of a sudden, you know, when it's time to run for president, we, we you know, God and country is a big deal. Or the mayor comes out and he's kissing babies. And God is like, this is supposed to be a lifestyle for us. You know, what will make us look different is that we don't wait for an election to come up. We're not waiting for a time to come up, to, you know, show who we are. This is supposed to be something we do every single day. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is what God is talking about. Listen, I don't want you to be reckless out there. I don't want you out there in chains. I don't want you being paraded in front of the cameras. No, there's a light on you. You've got to be an upright citizen. I'm, even in your persecution, even if they bring you before the magistrates, I don't want them finding out all this dirt on you. That, that's the thing, because it's going to bring blame and accusation against the church. When we walk, there's a part of our walk that has to be a part of our brain, a part of our thinking, a part of our psyche, that I'm representing something. You know, people who are in, in gangs and people... You know, or organizations, you know, they walk with a certain stride because, you know, they've got their jacket on that says that, you know, they're part of this football team or they're part of this basketball team. Or, you know, if there's a gang, they've got their little swag and there's a walk, you know, be a, you know, e Crips, they even have a dance, a Crip walk, you know, that, that signifies who they are. Well, the Lord is saying there's a walk that we walk as well that people, we don't even have to announce it, that, that we, you know, people will see it. And there are people who will attest to this right now that you never said it. And people said, there's something about you. I can see that glow. I can see your light. I can see your life. How are we supposed to shine? Well, listen, I can tell you right now, nobody is going to li listen to the gospel from a polit political agitator. It's not going to happen. I mean, now, now listen, you may get stirred up about some political issue, but the gospel can't come that way. So, so I can tell you right now, you might get people uh, stirred up about reparations. You might get people stirred up about gun laws. You might get people stirred up about abortion. I, you might get people stirred up about, you know, what's going on in, ter in Congress in terms of, uh, you know, getting this drug law passed or, or not passed. You know, you might get somebody stirred up about immigration, but you're not going to get them stirred up by the gospel by being an agitator. Jesus was not a political activist. Whatever you try to make him, he was not a political activist. You know what he did? He lived out God's character. That's what brought us here today. That's what got him killed. But, but I can tell you right now, Pontius Pilate said something that was so important. He says, I find no fault in this man. I've beaten him. I've, you know, I've, I've talked to him. I've examined him. And you know what? I can't find any fault. That's our testimony. The, the, listen, in this day, God says, I'm telling you now, they're going to throw you before the magistrate, magistrates. They're going to trump up charges. Make sure those are trumped up charges. Don't let them find anything. Our job is to reflect the character and the behavior of a child of God. The world is ignorant to what that's supposed to look like. So guess what? Our goal is not just to go to heaven. We've got to change our mindset. That's what this is all about. That's what this lesson is about. That's what Titus is meant to tell the, the people. You're living for now. You're going, listen, what's going to happen in the future is already set. Your eternal destiny is already set, but you're living for now. You've got a goal here that's not heaven. Your, your, you know, success for the church is not heaven. Success for the church is not making the rapture. Success for the church is Christ's likeness now. That's what it's all about. I mean, you know, the whole goal, the rapture is already sealed for us. The, the, our names are written in indelible ink that cannot be blotted out. How many times did that have to be said? That's not the goal here. The goal here is now let your light shine. What a shame. The rapture comes, you go home, and like that's all. That's it. That's it. Never exemplify Christ. Never led anybody to Christ. Your life was never an example for anybody to 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 to, to, uh, to follow. And you were never prepared and willing to do any upright and good work. Paul said, listen, let them know if they're prepared for anything. Why I don't know why they're preparing for the, you know, the political caucus and they're not prepared to do the real work that I told them to do. That's the thing. A saved politician must still recognize the gospel is still your priority. You let's, yes, get some parks out there. Make sure these roads get right. But I can tell you right now, if the the road to heaven, if you don't know how to lead people there, Whatever road you paved will be unpaved at some point. Whatever holes you filled in will be there again. So when you begin to look at this, and I'm going to end up here, I want you to get this. 
my focus here is not about a passive Christian life. And I want you to get this. This is this is Paul saying, wake them up and let them know they're supposed to get to work. This is not, we're just good Christians. We go to church on Sunday. We love God. We pledge allegiance to the flag. You know, we saluted. We you No. Know, you know, that, that that that's what's portrayed out here. But there's a war going on that's serious. And and Titus said, don't, Jesus comes to, to Paul and says, tell Titus, don't let them fall into this passivity. Don't let them fall into this little weak, sheepish thinking. No, remind them to be ready to take a stand. Listen, I want you to understand something. This is impossible to do without God's grace. This is impossible for us to actually do without his mercy. It's impossible to do without his help, but it's what we are charged to do. And I want you to get this. This is not, this, we're not rolling over and laying down because guess what? In a corrupt government, in a corrupt world, I can promise you right now that the government is not going to stay within its bounds. The government is not is going to eventually ask you and ask us all to do things that will compromise who we are. That will ask us to do things that will violate the truth of God. And guess what? Titus said, tell them this. Make sure they're ready to take a stand for a good work. Right. Let them know. Be, let them be prepared to be able to stand for Christ where they are. He's not telling us to roll over. He's telling us be prepared to be able to stand, to be able to help somebody that the whole everybody else says you cannot touch them. You better not touch them. That's what Jesus did. He was able to stand and touch lepers that the rest of the world said, wait a minute. How can you call yourself a priest or, or teacher and you don't even know they're unclean? No, we've got to be ready to take a stand and to help the woman with the issue of blood, to be willing to talk to that woman, uh, you know, that, that, that woman at the well. Those are the very sick things that, that we've got to be ready and willing to do, the things that will come against the tide. That woman can't touch you. She, she, she's poison. You know, she's bleeding all over the place. I remember that's what I'm here to do. We've got to heal those broken hearts. We're here to love those people that are unlovable. So don't forget, you know, it isn't just our gun laws because those are important. I'm going to be speaking uh, even this this weekend, you know, uh, at an event concerning gun sense in America. And, and I'm excited to be there and I believe in it. But in the end of the day, one of the things that happens, no matter what, what kind of sense we get in terms of guns, if we don't get God sense, then all the other things are nonsense. So listen, I want to leave that with you. I want you to recognize that this lesson from Titus is about, it's not about anti-politics. It's not about not being, you know, uh, you know, woke. It's not about like not knowing what's going on around you. But as a believer, as a Christian soldier, it's about reminding us what our priority is. You know, you get into a war and you stand in, in that war for a long time. You, we saw that in Vietnam. When you saw, we see that we saw that in Afghanistan. You stay there long enough, you can actually forget why you came. You know, you just, you know, I'm, so what are you fighting for? I'm just fighting for the guy next to me. You know, and that sounds cool, but the truth is. You knew when you left, you were fighting for a cause. You, you remembered why you were there. What stirred you up to go down and, and put your name on the roll? What's some reason, what a shame to get there and to forget why we're even fighting and just, I'm fighting for my church. I'm fighting for my denomination. You know, I'm fighting for my pastor. I'm fighting for my bishop. You know, I, what, you know I'm fighting for in the name of Christianity. And you forget that you're leading, you're supposed to lead people to Christ. You're supposed to be an example. You're supposed to be fighting against the tide of culture. You're supposed to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So listen, my hope is that you are blessed by the study today. I really hope that you grab this and you got this. And that's going to be my prayer, that you really get this locked in. Because, you know, sin is abounding. You know, and, and the, 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 the people are out there. But guess what? God is sending forth laborers because the harvest, the harvest he's looking for, he says, is plentiful. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again as we seal this Bible study. We just bless you right now for your people, for those that are on, those that are going to hear this at whatever time they get this. God, remind us again of our purpose. Remind us again that we're not to be just passive Christians and believers, that we need to be ready, willing, and able to perform the great works that you've called us to do. You promised that we would even do greater works than you did. And so, God, we thank you for every opportunity that you have given us to do those greater works. And we repent even now for those that our eyes have been shielded to. We were distracted by other things, angry about past things, things that are political, things that are cultural, things that are around us that we can't fix. But the, the, you've given us a great work. And we thank you even this night for reminding us, as you told Titus, remind them of who they are in Christ Jesus. God, we just thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Listen, I hope that this is a blessing to you, and I hope you have an awesome, awesome Thursday evening.